Welcome to the Spirit Bowl podcast. My name is Luke. I'm Richard, and I just got my master's degree in divinity. Everyone has a different perspective, so we're bringing on all sorts of people from different walks of life, like Jewish, Buddhist, Christian, atheist, and more, to discuss the biggest spiritual and moral questions and how they see it in their philosophy. Our goal is to find where we agree and disagree, and hopefully challenge ourselves to be better people in the process. Together, we shall dive deeper <laughs> and get weirder. All right, welcome back to the Spiritable Podcast. This time we have our special episode where we have fans slash friends of the show come on and basically roast our asses. Um, no, just kidding. They have topics to bring up or things to introduce that they're curious about, and we're going to chat about it. Yeah, you also uh, might notice that I am not in the studio. I'm in a strange foreign location because uh, I moved. It's very I live in I live in Michigan now. It's DM me sad. for my home address and social security number. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I am now uh, the assistant to the pastor of the Oak Arbor Church. Okay, have just people outside made the of office Rochester, jokes at you yet? Michigan. Being like assistant to the regional manager sort of deal? No, yeah. Mm-hmm, it's already happened. Okay, I figured. Yeah. Our first guest here is Caroline. Caroline, I won't, I won't uh, reveal your last name to, to keep your anonymity. So, Caroline, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited. So Luke and I don't know what your topic is at all. We were told that it was a secret. So I'm oh, very okay. excited to hear. Okay. I don't want to disappoint, but I guess we I'll just put it, it out much. there. Yeah. So what I have been, well, I guess Ben just told me it could be anything I'd been thinking about recently. So what I've been thinking about is where the reluctance from people comes to like state their religion and like when you can claim to be part of an organized religion and when it's time to say maybe i need to shop around hmm. if that makes sense hmm. so i guess i can give a little background to that where yeah, it like yeah. has come from so i feel like a lot of times when you're meeting someone or maybe you've known them for a little bit you're not diving into the deep stuff straight away and you ask what their religion is a lot of times you get the answer like i was raised fill in the blank, but now I don't go to church or I only go to church on Christmas and things like that. But rarely will anyone say, I don't have a religion. There's always kind of that qualifier of I I was raised one way or I've been one way, but now things are different. And I guess I'm just, everyone likes to talk about millennials and how no one, none of us go to church anymore. So what is it that is making people feel like they can't just say that they are that religion and like when can we get to the point where we can say like confidently i am this Hmm. well i think that's that's an interesting yeah that's an interesting question my immediate thought that came to mind was i think a lot of people that say like i was raised you know catholic or presbyterian or jewish or whatever um and now i'm not really that involved from my experience have been people that don't know for sure what they believe. And so they're kind of like, this is what I believed last. And now I just kind of haven't thought about it in a while and I'm doing other things, Um, which as sort of a naturally philosophical thinker always kind of baffles me because that's not how my brain works. I'm like, if you haven't decided like why the universe exists, how do you, how are you possibly going to work in the morning? Like, how are you getting out of bed if you're like, I don't really know why I'm here or who put me here or if anyone did or if anything happens after this world or if there's any innate meaning to my life. But I guess I'll, you know, go to my job at IHOP. Like, how do you how do you do that? Right. So that was that's kind of like you kind of basically said my thoughts was how like when how much do you have to think about it to decide? Because I think. I don't know the statistics on this, but I'm guessing that most people are either the religion, if they're really practicing a religion, they're the religion that they were raised in or they're not a religion, like, or don't see themselves as part of one. So when you're raised in a religion, it's a little passive. And then you turn into an adult and you're like, oh, I guess I'm in this religion now. Like that's, that's it. But you maybe never get the chance to like actually think about it. I also think it's hard for people to identify as one religion, 
it, it, and this is sort of a millennials sort of thing, but it happens with every new generation, but just now more at an extreme because of the advent of the internet, because people can be connected to any society, any community that they want at any given time instantly. It's hard to be like, oh, well, I was raised in this, so this is what I am, when you have access to thousands of other things at your fingertips. So I think that that makes it more difficult for people to identify. And also politically, because things are increasingly polarized and extreme, um, I find it hard to be like, yes, I sign on completely to this one thing. And then also in the background of my mind being like, well, there are these thousand other things that I can identify with that might be more close to what I'm thinking as a conglomeration of all these things. And what's the use in it? Like, we don't need church society in the same way that we used to because that used to be people's only social outlet, only like dating outlet. And now people just don't need that anymore to exist. So I think we have this tradition kind of falling away and millennials slash Gen Z, like younger people trying to fill in these gaps with what we have at our disposal, which is the internet. Yeah, I also think this really interesting question about whether someone is a member of a religion from doctrinal belief or from community presence. Um, and yeah, I think yeah. this shows up with every religion. Um, but I had a really interesting um, example of this in a Bible study that I was teaching when I was down in South Africa. Um, and someone in the Bible study, I was talking about belief in angels as either people that have died or as like separate divine or, or spiritual beings that aren't people. And I said, like, you know, I'm no expert in, in Catholic um, doctrine, but I believe this is where Catholics get their idea that angels um, aren't people and that you're a genderless spirit after death, not an angel. And someone was like, I'm Catholic. I, I, and we don't believe that. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, I'm not a member of your faith and I'm not trying to tell you what you believe. I'm trying to tell you from what I've studied of theology, that's official Catholic canon. Um, and they were like, hmm, maybe I'll look into it. And came back and were like, oh yeah, we do believe that. So I just didn't know. Yeah, and, and I think that's part of yeah. the like fear of claiming yourself as part of a group when you don't necessarily know that you can speak to every nuance or that you agree with every nuance or yeah 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 um i brought some statistics with you with me can i hit you with them yeah yeah i I prepared (laughs) um so because i was thinking about this just like in its own context and i was like there has to be numbers out there so um this is from the pew research center 2019 october is that a religious Uh, joke like church pew (laughs) (laughs) It, it should be, but it's not. Um, <laughs> we can please cut that. <laughs> it's staying in. <laughs> no, no. Oh, oh boy. sorry. Clean, Go okay, ahead. Clean tape. Uh, that's, okay. That's Luke's yeah, bad. I'm just pun. trying to bring the facts here and can't. Okay, so fifty. Per- so they're saying these are young millennials, eighteen to twenty-nine, which is actually like old Gen Z and young millennials. Um, So 50% of them believed in God and were absolutely certain of that. 21% believed in God and were fairly certain. Um, But 68% believe in heaven. So if you're comparing the 50% that believe in God and the 68% that believe in heaven, it kind of makes me the question like, what is essential to believe in, to be part of a religion. Um, because I had a professor in college once that was talking, she was Jewish and she was talking about how Judaism is the only religion in which you can be atheist, but still be fully part of that religion. And I was wondering like, could you claim to be Christian and be accepted fully by other Christians and not believe in God? I think religion as a definition has to have a higher power, right? Yeah, uh, but like I think that's the simplest form. I of think, a but religion. isn't it? I if you, I guess you could like Merriam-Webster dictionary it, but it's probably. I feel like it's more like a set of beliefs. I don't know if. But I think, I think religion as opposed to like a code of ethics 
or something like that. Like Confucianism, for example, or Kantian ethics aren't religions. Right. But they so are that's why kind of what separates yeah. them. What is having a higher power, religion. an accepted higher power. I, I like think even th- in Judaism, they have Jehovah, you know, the Old Testament God. And I think a, a Jew who doesn't believe in that might be culturally Jewish because they have a very, like, um, kind of rigorous or identified cultural. I'm, I'm phrasing that badly, but you know what I mean? So I think it right. has to have a higher power to be a religion. And that's what separates so if, it from a philosophy. If you were, say, someone who identified as Christian and would just kind of straight up say that I am Christian um, and you went to church every Sunday to be part of the community, you volunteered and were very involved in the community, but you had also really studied the doctrine of your church and kind of arrived at this. Like, I just don't believe that a God needs to be involved to have all of this be a part of my life. And then there's someone in that same church that really deeply believes in God, but doesn't go to church and doesn't serve their neighbor. Mm. Would you say that the person that's more involved isn't, can't claim to be part of that church because they don't believe in God. So I think that's kind of the essence of my question is, is there something in religion that immediately excludes certain people from being able and being allowed to claim that they're part of it? Um, I I would say no, but I would also say those two hypothetical people aren't part of the same religion. I think they might be part of the same church community, but I tie religion more to belief than to organization because there are people that are Christian that aren't Catholic or Lutheran or anything. Um, And there are people that are just kind of religious in general that are like, yeah, I kind of know God exists, but I don't really like any of the religions that I found. It's like, there are parts I agree with, but because I don't like all of it, I can't really say I'm that um, idea, which I also don't think is necessarily true. I think like there, there are parts of the doctrine of my church that I struggle to understand and honestly that I don't like. And at this point in my life, I think it's a me problem, not a God problem. Um, But I don't like them and I don't get how they're true sometimes, but I still am part of this faith because the general practice and belief of this faith helps me be a better person. Um, But that was a tangent. Sorry. Um, (laughs) I, I think I tie it more to belief. So those people that are part of the same community it's awesome that they're okay with being in a community of kind of practicing goodness to other people together, but they don't have the same faith practice because one believes in God and one doesn't. And that innately comes with a different understanding of what your faith means. I want to, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I kind of want to push back though, because I think religion might be better. I'm just, maybe, I don't know if I fully believe this, but I'm going to go with, go with it. Um, religion might be better as a community than as a set ideology. Because kind of what's the point, if, if it's all based around a set of spiritual principles or ideas, then, then what, you go on Sunday and everyone believes exactly the same thing and you just read out of a book? Like, that's not much of a community. So I think a religion might be better as, okay, yes, we're loosely Christian. We meet on Sundays. We believe in Jesus. We believe in being a good person. Let's hang out on a Sunday, um, have, a, have a message that everyone can relate to, and then bond together as people around this set of principles rather than just come to be instructed, maybe. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And I'm not saying that those two people that that you brought up, Caroline, the two Jewish people, one believes in God, one doesn't. I think definitely it's great that, well, I think, did you say Christian? Oh, right. Christian, right. Your, yeah. Your teacher like, was, was a Jewish in, person. Right. In relation to Christianity, <laughs> can that exist? Um, I think it's awesome that those two people come together and form a stronger community by both being there. Um, but I think the caveat that I was saying is, I don't think they're of the same faith. 
I think it's great that that people of varied belief can be part of the same faith community, but I think their like internal faith is not the same. So yeah. if you had those two people, would the one who believes in God be able to say to the other person, you are not, let's say they're Presbyterian, you are not Presbyterian. Like who has the right to claim? Yo, no one has the right. That's that. crap. Right. It's like, do you get to just make up if you're a part of like, yeah. right now I feel like I agree with, let's say 60% of one faith. I can say that's my faith. And I yeah. don't believe, but the 40% might be really, really important to other people of that faith. So they, do they get like, does the community have the right to excommunicate you? Yeah, way? that's, that's really, that gets into like a lot that. of interesting nuance, uh, like among specific organizations, because at the end of the day, like if I say I'm Presbyterian, the, no one can tell me I'm not right. Like right. if they're like, no, you aren't. I'm like, okay. But like specific ex- acceptance into organizations is a different thing. Right. Like, but I feel I like that's of- part of the, like in the kind of the original thought of like, why do people say I was raised this, but now I don't really practice. It's that fear of someone being like, well, I'm also that. And you're not. Not being yeah. accepted, being shunned right. away. And then I and then we do sort of draw a line, you know, I was baptized into a religion and then I joined a church and to do so you have to say like, oh, I believe these things to join said church. And that can maybe create a sort of false hierarchy of like, hey, I'm an official member and you're not. So who's really right. like you like, can like, make a list of the important things. Yeah. And, and sign and that think, and then yeah. the other things are out of the way. Yeah, that's that's tough. And like obviously nuance is so important, but I do think it's important to I, I don't know. I mean, all religions are unique, so to have unique aspects of each one that can be used as identifiers, like we just kind of need that as people to be able to be like, okay, Christianity represents these three bullet points. Like I don't think that's inherently bad. Um so If you I, I, like if you could put every religion though in three bullet points, do you think they'd kind of look exactly the same oh a ton of them i mean everyone (laughs) basically follows the 10 commandments so yeah yeah i mean if you put it all in like one bullet point it's just like be good i think basically every faith practice says be good now it gets complex when you put that idea into a plan and that's where the necessary distinction comes in um That's what I was also thinking about in terms of like, how do you get millennials or Gen Z back to church or do they need to go back to church or how do you just get them feeling affiliated with your organization? And I think that the younger generation really likes to have a say and to like really feel like they are connected and really believe in something. So at what point can someone who was maybe born and raised in a church and then doesn't practice as an adult, come back and say, actually, I would like to make this church or this organization a place that I feel good about raising my kids in. So who has the right to kind of say something needs to change when religions are kind of based on the idea that there are truths and there are things that aren't true and there's good and there's wrong. I love that. Uh, I I love that kind of person. I want to meet those people because I think we desperately need those in almost every religion um just because change has to come from the inside and i think there's a sort of older false dichotomy of like oh well these kids aren't coming to church it's like when when i think it's more the opposite of why isn't the church serving these people like just look at the story of jesus jesus didn't just like sit around and wait for people to follow him he was like hey no you right there yeah you put down your stuff come come with me I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you. I'm going to show you this new way. And then people were like, oh, uh, okay, yeah, I guess I will stop being a fisherman. <laughs> um, so, like, I think we can f- fall into this laziness as church organizations where we're like, well, we have the truth, and we don't need to minister to people. They need to come find us. And it's like, no, we need to figure out how to serve people with what they actually need. And I think that's the big problem. The big problem is not, like, people not going to church. It's church not going to people. Right. But I've also seen it put out there, like people who 
are really involved in their churches and then will say, if you want to change, make your own church. And they feel like they have the right to keep things the same. And I think that comes from the belief that there's like things that are just absolutely true. Mm -hmm. But I think we don't necessarily always take a a step back and say, there are these truths. Maybe it's the way we're applying them that you can't change the truth, but you can change the way maybe that you're viewing it or applying it to the world. And I think that's the change that would need to happen rather than just saying like your book's wrong for a thousand pages. Yeah, I I totally agree. And it's, I really like Luke, your point of change happens from the inside. And as someone who is a younger person and a leader of a religious organization at this point, it's really frustrating when people are like, (laughs) <laughs> when people are like, I like a lot of this, but because I don't like that thing, I'm not a part of it. Yeah. And I'm like, if you like a lot of it, be a part of it and work to change that one thing. Because if everyone who wants change leaves instead, then the organization stagnates and stagnates and dies. But but also to Caroline's point, like I fall into that category, but then I kind of trap myself being like, well, what if the changes I want are just because I'm selfish? And what if I'm wrong? I don't want to change something that could be right towards something that could be wrong just because of an opinion that I have or a perspective that I have. You know, like that that line is so tough. I'm glad you brought that up, Killing, because like, yeah, I, I don't really know what the answer is. And I think we have to do what our instinct and our rationality tells us to do. But yeah, I... I I struggle with that a lot because there are a lot of changes that I want in the organization that I'm a part of, but what if I'm wrong? Richie, help me. Help me, master. Yeah, I (laughs) I don't like that. (laughs) Um, I think a big part of it, something something that frustrates me, but I also understand, is when people are like, I think this should be different. And I'm like okay, why do you want that to be different? And they're like, well, because that seems like it'd be better. And I'm like, I love that. And I love that you want things to be better, but it feels like my job is to be a representative of uh, a text, you know, and to say like, how does this text apply to our life? And so it's hard for me when people come to me and they're like, let's make this thing different. And for me to be like, ah, but look at how it says how it should be. Um, And I think I, but I totally agree with you, Caroline, that I think a lot of it is about how do we interpret this and everything is interpreted through our bias and our lens. And so to assume that the way we're doing it is the way that these words say is the only way it should be done. I think is really limiting and that's where church growth happens. And if you look at the history of any church organization, you see that them taking the same truths and interpreting it differently. And one of my favorite examples in my church organization in, in the general church of the new Jerusalem is there used to be back in the early 20th century, an idea that because preaching is supposed to be, sharing God with people, right? Like being a vessel by which God can communicate with people. And it's not really about you, which is a cool idea and helps me not be, have a big head when I'm preaching. Um, But they took that to say, so you should have no visible emotional expression when you preach, because then you're putting yourself in the way of God. And that's the most outlandish thing I've ever heard because what that is, is you should preach, but not in a way that anyone could possibly listen to. It should be a chore. It It should be a (laughs) chore to sit in those pews and hear you just drone on. And I'm glad that our church is not prioritizing that ideal anymore. Um, But like they got that from the truth and there is objective truth, but all, the moment it becomes our understanding of it, it's innately subjective. And I think that, I think on a personal note, and I said this on past podcasts, I think people should be the most aggressive and rigorous toward their own ideas. 
if you are being more aggressive and rigorous toward another person's ideas than your own, I don't think you're doing it right. Mm. And I think that works on kind of a macro scale of an organization as well. Like, I think organizations should be rigorously analyzing and and reanalyzing their own ideas and their own conclusions. And when we don't do that, we have churches that stagnate and then can't reach people. Right. It would be interesting if we just handed over all the religious books to like a completely blank slate and said, could you read these and tell me what you think they say? Like a a religious consultant comes in. (laughs) Yeah. Like someone that's been like raised on an island without any other people around, but they can somehow read. (laughs) <laughs> I'd love you know. that. I hate well, to poop on the party, but well, we wait, have two Caroline's? minutes down okay. until Eric is sliding in here. So just uh, say whatever you're going to say. Uh, um, yeah, Caroline, I wanted to throw it over to you and, and see what you think. Like, where does change come from in a religious organization? Do people have to split off and make a new church? Or uh, can people go inside and change it? Should it change? Like, what? Are, yeah, what are your thoughts on all that? I think that my initial reaction is that change comes from a ton of outside pressure. Like you have to push for a mile just to get an inch, Mm -hmm. but taking in mind what Richard said about, you don't want to like feel like you're adapting truths for the times because truths are supposed to be timeless. I think it takes those people that are, like you said, Luke in the church or in it enough that they have some sort of influence and some sort of background and understanding just to, ask and just to keep asking questions to get answers that aren't people's answers but answers that are from the actual the doctrine of what whatever church you're a part of and then decide from there like is this something that could be applied differently or is it something that if I want to be a part of the this organization I just have to yeah I don't know accept but be aware of well, Richard, is there a process in the church hierarchy or church organization for re-examining old truths, old identities? Yeah, I mean, I think like the the council of the clergy is what it's called. And that's often where people will be like, hey, I've been studying this and I think we've been interpreting it wrong. How often um, does that actually lead to change? I mean basically all the change that our church has ever experienced has probably come about by that method. But so I think maybe speaks to the, like the people in that council have to really know their, like they have to have had that education, right? You can't just kind of come out of just being part of the congregation and say, I need change, which kind of creates a barrier to diverse voices. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is a really interesting kind of trade-off. Um, so we are a, um, clergy led church instead of a lay led church. And the distinction there is one of that prioritizes, um, staying true to the text and the, the truths and, is more more often about leans toward protecting than outreaching. So I think with our structure, we have the added challenge of of really having to reach out in a big way, where as a lay led congregation, their biggest structure, their, their biggest challenge is probably holding true to the what they think is right instead of just kind of going with whatever um is easy or is popular um assuming that what's popular isn't what is true um so yeah with just different setups there's different challenges yeah man well, this is really fun stuff to dig into i know we need to get to our next guest though so i want to thank caroline for coming on here and uh throwing some thoughts at us that was really fun yeah, thanks Thank so you much guys for having me. Yeah. It was super pleasant. Awesome. We'll have you back on sometime. <laughs> oh, I would love to to see you maybe outside of the computer screens. Yeah. In well, like many months. <laughs> well, not you, Richard. Someday, yeah. Richard, hey, far away. <laughs> come visit, okay? <laughs> it's only a 10-hour <laughs> drive. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Caroline, we'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye. Hello. Who do we have here? I'm-
Hey, how are you guys doing? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us, Eric. Yeah, you got it. When I saw the uh, suggested topic you wanted to discuss, I got very excited about it. Oh, yeah. I got nervous because I, thought... I felt stupid immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I have thought about just this uh, topic in relation to my dissertation that I wrote for my master's. And also, I have researched a uh, past new church person who, from new church theology, came to a very similar conclusion to what you put forward. But sorry, to keep our to not keep our audience in the dark, do you want to talk about what what you'd like to talk about? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so I came across this this article that was. Um, about this paper and I, I read the paper. So this is a paper published in a peer reviewed physics journal that from observations of uh, quantum physics arrives at this idea of, of how to think about reality that is just incredibly similar to what Swedenborg describes in the uh, book he wrote 250 years ago, Divine Love and Wisdom, um, which he says is from divine inspiration. It's a spiritual work. And here's this interpretation of physics that gives such a similar conception. So that, that really uh, blew my mind. Um, I could, uh, should I give some sort of background on, on what yeah, let's, Swedenborg let's, said well, let's first? Let's talk about the, the paper itself a little bit. So um, I, I read over uh, the same article and, what I got out of it was basically that it's a self-simulation hypothesis, which is that instead yep. of having our basic reality be a physical world with mental activity, it's this really complex mental activity stemming from uh, a grand thought universe with subthoughts, very intricate and intelligent thought theory, combining with free will to manifest a physical reality. So instead of physical reality having mental activity, it's mental activity having a physical reality, which yeah. is hard for me to really grasp. But then at the end of the article, it talked about how, you know, imagine that, like, just think of a dream that we've had, a really vivid dream. When you're in the dream, it, it doesn't feel like a dream. It is so complex, high fidelity, like, we don't lag. It's just reality in that moment. So what if what we're experiencing right now was that on just a whole different level? And there's no way we could really tell, but it is an interesting thought. So that's kind of what I got out of the article. Am I missing any major points there? Yeah, um, I mean, no, <laughs> that's right. And so, I mean, one of the similarities, I guess, is what you just said, that there's, they conceive of this grand thought which, of which we are subthoughts, right? So we're like an individual consciousness is a, is a, 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 a part of the grand thought. And so, you know, we can, we can dream in a way that's indistinguishable from what we perceive waking reality to be until we wake up and realize it. But it's, it's personal to us because we're the ones dreaming. But this grand thought, which is like a macrocosm of us, could do the same sort of thing. So if, so it could... Right you know, reality could be like the dream of the grand thought. And one of the similarities is that Swedenborg, of course, has the grand human, which is a similar idea made up of the individual, you know, like your channel is called the grand human project. Yeah. I guess one of, um, what, what tripped me up initially about the article, and I do want to link it back to DLW, like Divine Love and Wisdom DLW, for those who are on the in. Uh, <laughs> what tripped me up in the article was having physicality manifest from thought combined with free will how right. how does that happen like is that just saying right. physicality is a sort of veil or is it saying no reality matter is actually created from thought yeah well see that's the weird thing where this all comes from is the sort of uh discoveries of quantum physics that happened 100 years ago and have been confusing us ever since which is uh, principally like two of the weirdest things is that unlike the newtonian physics that came before in 
quantum physics, if you know everything about something, say a particle, um, but it's really anything, it's just that we can measure it when we go down to the particle level. All the, the state of this, this particle, the where it is, how fast it's moving, all the forces on it, if you know everything about it and predict where it's going to be in time B, you know, unlike with Newton, you can't predict it exactly. You can only say, like, if you do it a billion times, you can predict the exact probability distribution. So you can't, so that's where the, the free choice part comes in because it, it's, they call it, most scientists will use the word random. And of course, Einstein said, well, I don't think God plays dice with the universe, but some scientists, some of the original scientists use the word choice, you know, as if the particle is making a choice and there's no real distinction between what you observe between a choice and randomness. Um, so that, that's the free will part. But the other, the other part, which I think is more to, to your question, is that between when you observe something at point A and point B, it's not like, see, particles, an ancient word from, from the Greeks, I think, who, or it's their idea anyway, who thought of it like, what if the universe is made out of little bits of stuff? Mm -hmm. But a particle in, in modern physics, it's not a bit of stuff. There's not a thing there. It's the, the idea is that between and when you measure something, there's nothing except for the math, which is to say there's nothing except for formalized logic, which is sort of to say that, physical reality is nothing but logic and the choices that mm. the, that the logic that whatever that logic is describing makes. So it's like, and so there, there've been a number of hypotheses that came out of this observation, which is that um, reality is, is basically just the math. So like there's a different hypothesis, like from Max Tegmark who says that, well, since, since that's true, any math you can think of has its own physical reality that it manifests to. Um, so that was his idea. And the, the regular simulation hypothesis is, well, since all reality is math, then um, maybe we're just a simulation on a giant alien computer somewhere and yeah. it's doing the math. But that's, I think the problem with that is that that leaves out the choice part and the freedom part and the consciousness part. So, so and, this, and I think the article pointed out with that, it leaves out like, okay, so what's the origin of that computer? Yeah. It doesn't really solve anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I thought this was a really fascinating read. It's really cool to see quantum mechanics from a scientific community that is open to metaphysics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause I know that's often really challenging for the scientific community because the scientific method basically limits is self-limiting to the physical, you know, cause metaphysics by Nate, by definition can't be measured in the right. same way. Um, I think, yep. so I thought that was really fascinating. Um, there are a couple places where I think their theory differs from new church ideas on it. Um, the first is that from my reading of the article and the original publication that I read through most of and got a little lost when there started to be specific formulas and things like that, um, yes. um, was that the subconsciousness idea to the grand conscious, they didn't, they didn't outline any real distinction there that like the the subconscious which would be us to the grand thought um we're just like little tiny simulations that the grand thought is running and there's no real distinction of identity right um, and i think that's a place where new church theology differs because the whole the the first essential of love is to love something outside of yourself and so in the creation of people, very specifically, they were created outside of the divine so that love could be actualized because it needs to be a consenting um, two-part union. Right. Um, or else it's just ego. Right. Um, so that's the first place where I feel like it differed. Um, the second place was about the the origin of the physical world. Um, 
And, and I think that in heaven, the manifestation that they're talking about in this article is exactly what happens. Thought manifests through representation into the, the, the physical world around you in heaven. Um, you know, it talks about how your, your location is based on your loves. The time of day that it is, is based on your current state. Um, your thought of another person determines your distance from them. You know, all of it, the entire spiritual physics is a manifestation of your internal. Um, now, obviously it is love through thought that manifests, not just thought like this article talks about, at least in divine love and wisdom. Right. Um, but on earth, there's an important distinction of the physical world having its own fixity. It has its own structure apart from humankind. And that allows us to undergo the reformation process. If you, yeah. I mean, if you think about the phrase like, you are who you hang out with. If from the moment we were born, our distance from other people and everything around us was just a manifestation of our thought, we would be who we hang around with. And there would be no real way for us to make progress, for us to change. But the fact that like I run into people who have different thoughts than I do and who push me and who argue with me and who make me doubt myself and who make me rethink what I thought I knew and just like the, the struggles of the day to day that I didn't want to have happen and didn't think about happening, but now came up and I have to deal with my reaction to it. All these things would allow us to grapple with our tendency toward selfishness and evil and hopefully come out the other side changed. Right. And if it was just a manifestation directly, then we wouldn't run into these barriers in the same way. Yeah. And I, I mean, the way I interpreted it was not that it was the sort of manifestation of thought in the same way that it would be like in the spiritual world. Um, the way I interpreted it is more like degrees in thought that go down towards like mathematical reality at the bottom, like the lowest degree okay. of the spiritual. And then out of the mathematical reality, um, so, I mean, this is really getting into sort of the bigger parallel between this and divine love and yeah, wisdom, which is, okay, so... So Swedenborg says that everything that exists in the spiritual world is exists because it receives um, divine love or wisdom, which are the only things that truly exist. So mm -hmm. the thing, the main thing that exists is the main thing that can receive love or wisdom, which is a mind, especially the grand mind, the grand human. So, and but the, those things travel down through the spiritual world um, in lower and lower degrees. And um, so like the lowest degree would be things like logic and reason and say degrees of freedom. And then he talks about at the lowest degree of the spiritual world, it, um, it then moves down through the degrees of the natural world down into the most fundamental, they didn't have the fundamental properties science back then but i mean the fundamental particles but but i think what he's talking about is is like the most fundamental particles of nature um which are which are related to mathematics um and and i i the way i interpreted this paper is that it's making a similar point that the particles come out of the whole world of mathematics which is like the lowest level of the sort of mental space um, okay I, I I was interpreting it as the, the distinction I was trying to lay out, and maybe I was misinterpreting their point, is that the reality doesn't filter through the human mind, doesn't filter through the natural human mind, the person's mind. Um, the grand human mind, obviously, is the source of it, the Lord's mind, God's yeah. mind. Um, but it felt like that paper was saying its idea of sub-thoughts, which are people, basically people's minds um, 
create the reality. And mm. I think in new church theology, it is correspondence down, like you were saying, through degrees of heaven apart from humanity that goes both into the natural world and into the human mind, but not through the human mind into the natural world. Right. I agree. I don't know how much I'm reading in my own prejudice into what they were saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, it's possible I was misunderstanding that. Yeah. I, I yeah, I agree. And, um, but, uh, just to continue on sort of um, what I took them both to say um, after that. So after it filters down into the, well, with what Swedenborg says, he says that it filters down into the most fundamental things of nature where it has this. um, So the Lord has a presence there because it receives those things and then inclination back to the human form out of which arises the uh, mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, then humans who can, you know, manifest love and wisdom and return back to the spiritual and towards and towards the divine full and circle. join with the combined. Yeah, right, exactly. So it's a full circle. So and that that was the biggest resonance between the the paper is that they're both talking about a circle with a big difference, but um, both like a causal circle between the spiritual and natural. The big difference is that theirs was a self creating circle that didn't go up to the infinite. And in the paper, they actually talk about that, that it's, it's similar to spiritualism, except that it, it's, it's doesn't include the infinite in their, in their conception of it. It doesn't include yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they made the point to distinctly say like, it is not infinite and it is evolving. And that's why it's running this process. Right. Um, and I think it like, is basically how human thought works, like how our thought works. Like when we play out something in our minds, when we're like, oh man, I need to have a tough conversation with my friend. What am I going to say? How is it going to go? We play it out because we're trying to evolve and adapt. Um, And so I saw a, a definite link between, it seemed like it was saying like, there's just a big person somewhere uh, because I define person as a mind that thinks with free will and rationality and the ability to love and grow wise. And so this grand thought is basically just like, there's a big person somewhere. I, I read that as more of a collective than a big individual. Like we are kind of like what we talked about um, a couple podcasts ago, like a big collective thought piece is, it, what, what is what, how I interpreted the grand thought. And we are all stemming from within that. So that one thing is nothing without its subparts. Yeah. But I I think I saw it sort of like in the same way that you could, when you're trying to think about what you're going to do tomorrow, create a bunch of little simulations in your head about the different ways it could go, but they're not distinct from you at all. Like your little simulations have no worth on their own. They're just to serve you as a grand, as, as you, as the grand thought. And so sure. in that same scale, the grand thought that this paper is talking about, we are all just kind of little simulations of it. Yeah. And it is one entity and we are we have no importance or distinction from it other than our ability to help it adapt, I guess. And once you get it to that level, that becomes a very sad reality. I hear what you're saying. In which I am I am an imaginary nothingness. And Maybe it's me selfishly wanting to be something, um, but I prefer to feel like or, or maybe I was created. I was created to be distinct because right. I feel pretty distinct. But maybe this um, grand thought is just constantly trying to improve itself or discover new things, and the only way it can do that is to run its own simulations. Just how if we want to change ourselves, we need to run our own simulations of how this is going to play out in our future, how we want to change and adapt that sort of thing. So this is just on a whole different scale. And so maybe there is worth in us being sub thoughts in trying to change the whole, like we are all one sort of mentality, fixing the one by fixing the little parts. But, but if, but to what end, you know, if all of the created universe is a simulation by this grand thought, how is it improving? Well, couldn't you say the same, but like, what's the purpose of heaven then? If like, 
because it's never going to reach perfection. It's never going to reach a totality of human beings being in heaven. Then what's the purpose of that existing if it's not a destination based thing? Like, well, no, because there are other people that are real and different from me that through my improvement in heaven, I can help better every day. But if everything is just a simulation of one grand thought, then it understanding itself better. What is it? So first of all, what is it understanding better? Well, couldn't you if say it's that God that is becoming more perfect the more people enter heaven? No, heaven's becoming more perfect. I wouldn't say God's becoming more perfect because God is infinite. But if love God's and not being served by people entering heaven and reciprocal goodness and love, then why is he there? What do you mean? Can you rephrase like, that? Like, then what's the purpose of people going to heaven and serving each other? Because that in and of itself has to be a reciprocal um, connection with the divine. If the divine didn't get anything out of us and it was just stagnant in the same, then why even go through all the trouble of having us be in existence and having a reciprocal connection with him? If he's not being affected by us, then wouldn't that be the same as the grand thought? Well, I guess um, to, to Eric, put it this way. Eric, you've heard a chime way. in too. I... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Richard. I think, I, th I think what God gets is the ability to love, like the ability to actuate his love. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, for example. So what, does God get the kick out analogy. of heaven being more full? Like, Well, no, he gets, he gets his love actuated more fully. So isn't like, then God more say, fulfilled as time goes and as people enter heaven? I mean, you could say more fulfilled, but not more improved, I guess. Yeah. Like, let's say... But there's something let's say changing. You... My, my point is there's something changing. Except I... I think that from God's perspective, is outside of time. So it's like the whole That's history of time is what he's interacting with. And like, which is, this is sort of a, an outside of time sort of conception true. as well. It's sort of a... Mm -hmm. I guess the analogy I was going to try to use is like, let's say you really like your spouse or girlfriend or partner or whatever, and you really, really love them. And so you reach out and you hold your hand. You don't love them more by doing that necessarily, but you feel that love more in the moment by that, by that manifestation of it. And that's sort of what our reciprocation for the Lord is. Like it doesn't make him better at loving for us to love him back, but it makes his love manifest, which is the essence of what love wants. Isn't that just like us playing Sims 3 and getting satisfaction out of making a holistic world that is self-fulfilling and self, um, like sort of its own self-prophecy running through? We're well, not being changed, but we're being fulfilled um, by it, just like the grand thought is being fulfilled um, by having its sub thoughts run out their own algorithms, just like God is being fulfilled by having more people love others and love him. Well, so I think the big important distinction is that if Sims 3, if our Sims actually had their own freedom and rationality, then you first you of all, what an Sims amazing 3. video game. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I agree. That's the, the main thing is the, the free choice that gives us autonomy as, I mean, I think simulation is a bad word. They just used it because of it, it was a similar theory sort of, right. but mm -hmm. it's a simulation that has its own freedom and autonomy where each component does or each particle does. So, so, so do you think this, this study was saying that each sub thought has its own autonomy? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Hmm, that's really fascinating. I didn't pick up on that. But isn't its own autonomy just like a complex, chaotic algorithm? Well, so that's the question. Again, I mean, they did use the word they did use the word algorithm, but again, an algorithm sort of implies the lack of freedom to me. Yeah. So then you get into determinism, like we talked about right, with right. destiny, about yeah. whether whether everything is predetermined and just based on the previous cause effect or whether in that moment of choice, there is truly free will. Yeah. And proving free will is I think like trying to prove God and it's just kind of like 
I think it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what, what <laughs> to quickly zoom out, what I think um, is cool looking down at this versus at our belief in many other religions is this is sort of a switch from what's important is materialism and substance to what's important is no the meaning behind it the um not solution to the uh math problem but what the meaning we can glean out of that it's the emphasis of meaning over materialism and just mind over matter like in in a different sort of way and i think that's really cool because that relates back to kind of what the new church is about is it's not important that this desk is here it's how it can serve me it's not important that i'm sitting six feet away from ben it's the interaction that we can have and how we can um build off of each other same with the relationships in general like that's just throughout all degrees it's the importance of the meaning not materialism and i think that's really cool that that science and just that blend of science and spirituality and religion and philosophy how they can kind of all come together in this sort of metaphysical way i'm about it yeah yeah absolutely Whew. Yeah, I, I loved your your comparison to DLW there and the idea of descending and coming back up. Right. Um, and, it, and it's kind of crazy the way that it um, gives a rationale for why it comes back up. Like in, in the in the theory, it's like it has to to cause it to cause the circle that lets it exist. That has to find an efficient way to create a mind, which is sort of similar to why it, it does for um in swedenborg's version yeah it's fascinating with maybe the little nitpicks that i would have about what it comes to it's fascinating to see people looking at the scientific world and coming so close to something that is uh, um if you believe swedenborg um descended from god and and sometimes proved using certain science, but but not doesn't have its origin in science. So sort of the yeah. yeah from the highest and the lowest coming to a very similar idea of what existence looks like. Exactly, it'd be different if somebody wrote something like this who who already believed in what Swedenborg said. But since they're they're coming at it from a completely different position, it's pretty pretty startling to me. Yeah. That's really cool. I, I'm very. If you find any more things like this, send them my way. I'm. Right. This yeah, is thank my you so much for bringing it to the table. I know we have to get to our next guest oh, yeah. here, but this is a really sure. fascinating thought train to go down. And uh, appreciate you uh, guys putting up with me badgering with with a different sort of <laughs> devil's advocate mindset. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> yeah. thanks a lot for having me on. Oh, of course, you were yeah. great. We'd love to. Some. some Sorry, sometimes when, when we have uh, more time, maybe off air, or maybe we'll have you back on, remind me to talk to you about Charles Augustus Tolk. Oh, I was going to say the same thing. I'll have to look, who, uh, look him up. He was an early new church guy who um, got deep into this idea of metaphysics and uh, creation through the mind and stuff like that. All that I've studied Tolk him. talk. Oh, that's, that's pretty good. About Tolk. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that might get I'm going Lord off of the rings again. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you. All right, thank time. you guys. <laughs> See, you, right. man. See, See you, man. See you. Yeah, I got a pee. Can you talk to Veronica's IP? Is she here? Hey, Hello. how's it going? Luke's gone. Um, I'm taking forever. over. I'm the host now. What's up? Ben's the host now. Luke. <laughs> Luke didn't want to talk to you. He was like, ugh, Veronica's next. I'm out. Yeah, I mean, that sounds about right. Yeah, classic Luke. <laughs> um, no, he had to pee. He'll be right back. No worries. No worries. How's life? It's pretty good. How about you? Sonia took me on a little tour the other day. Oh, yeah. Well, this is my office. I love it. Welcome it looks very office. scholarly. Yes, thank you. Thank you. These are all actually my books. <laughs> I have, I own too many books. Um, the, the book I am most excited about as a nerd is uh, this one. I stole it from the Swedenborg library slash it yep. was in their old book section that they didn't want. Yep. Um, and it's true Christian religion. Yep. But it is first edition that has Helen Keller's forward. Oh, nice. Which is super dope. Yeah. And Helen Keller's a dope human being overall. And her writing is like some of the most powerful writing I've ever read in my life. 
And her writing really powerfully about something I care a lot about. Yeah. Is who it's cool. It's a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, Veronica. We're all back. Oh, oh, oh. Huh, whoop, whoop. You got it. I, I was just saying, I was just saying we're all back. Welcome to the show, Veronica. Thanks for yeah. thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Of course. I'm excited. Now, now are you here to roast our roast us or or do you have um a thought piece? <laughs> yeah. Oh, way, to back, way, to, way to back out of that, Luke. I didn't realize roasting was That's an option. That's always an option. I, I, in case, uh, in fact, always an option to roast. Oh, uh, shame. See, I actually came with with a question. Okay. Well, we're ready. Uh, or a discussion topic, at least. One that I think is uh, near and dear to at least Richard's heart. I, I okay. assume your your heart as well, Luke. We'll and that is the, the subject of, of devil worship. Okay. Oh, in the form of Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, I see. Oh. Ah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Very near and dear to my heart. It's uh, the only devil worship I endorse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I thought it would be, uh, I I certainly have been doing more Dungeonsing and Dragonsing uh, since being quarantined. Uh, I don't, I just, I wanted to, to get your guys's view on on i guess the controversy and the scandal of it all well there was a time during quarantine where i was playing D D three nights a week which which is too <laughs> much and i was exhausted uh but clearly i you know oh you know if i'm gonna be honest spent more time playing D D than i did praying or reading the bible so what does that what does that tell you that's something I could improve oh. on. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. You know, if you're playing D and D three nights a week, that's probably like ten hours or so of D and D. Richard, have you read the Bible for ten <laughs> hours this week? This week, no. Good couching, <laughs> like you would on another <laughs> average well, week. Well, in school he did. <laughs> yeah, when I was in school, baby, you know I did. <laughs> you know I read the Bible lots. Um, but I think this is really. Yeah, D and D is super interesting as a little study of um, specifically Christianity's view toward fantasy in general, which is um, bizarre. And I think, go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say it's bizarre because C.S. Lewis, you know, uh, writer of the Narnia Chronicles, massive Christian, like wrote some really fundamental works uh J.R.R. Tolkien I'm pretty yeah. sure was a Christian so like a lot of fantasy create was, was J.R.R. Tolkien a, a Christian Ben fact check me there technically technically Catholic technically Catholic okay um that's a type of Christian yeah, that's a type of Christian yeah so like a bunch of Christians created these massive fantasy worlds so why Christians be hating yeah growing up uh our next door neighbors were um I actually don't know what branch of Christianity they were hmm. like doesn't matter but they were very strictly like magic is evil um, train of thought and so being a horrible little boy or horrible little boys my brothers and I would write Harry Potter in chalk on our Ooh. right outside their house and stuff and he would come out with a hose and wash it off and you know it's just some classic childhood religious persecution no big deal <laughs> Super cash. Just some cash persecution. No, that wasn't a great uh, way to respect other people's religious beliefs. But I also, if I'm going to be honest, struggle to connect with the idea that um, fantasy creation is any way inherently evil. Like it is going to in some way lead me to the devil. And honestly, like more than a lot of things fantasy sets up a very um, binary good versus evil scenario that is also set up by most religions of like, there is innate good, there is innate evil. Like there are gods in D and D that are just good. And there are gods that are just evil and that I think is a useful thing, especially for young minds to recognize that there is extreme good and there is extreme evil. And between that, there is nuance, but that doesn't mean that extreme good and evil aren't out there and aren't real and aren't something we should be fighting for or against. 
So I'm a big proponent, well, big fan. At the same time, we've also played D&D campaigns where we have been the evil crew, so. <laughs> and- well, that was going to be my next question or sort of a follow-up question, which was when you look through uh, sort of the lore of D&D or of these um, tabletop role-playing games, uh, they do have specific races set aside within their own alignment charts. So when you're looking at Dungeons and Dragons, you have tieflings, which are technically supposed to be evil in their alignment. Uh, not, so just- not in fifth edition. <laughs> <laughs> fifth edition's woke as heck, man. Fifth woke edition's as woke heck. ass. Yeah. Um, but just, just sort of that... Uh, is there so the whole nature of these games is to be your own story and your own storytelling but is there anything to is there anything to the alignment chart at all um i think i think yes i think it's the same with um being able to learn about yourself and about life by playing a character like as an actor like getting to play the bad guy isn't necessarily going to make you a worse person. In a lot of ways, you get to take on a personality that is so maybe different from yours and be able to see these distinctions um, and learn from this other type of person. So even if you're playing a character in D&D who's lawful evil and you're choosing things, I'm going to guess that you're going to feel pretty gross when you choose to do gross things in the game or like recognize it as so far away from your own self-identity. And I think that's a useful thing to be able to do in a safe sort of space like that where there are no actual physical consequences to your action. It's a thought experiment, just like a conversation with someone else is about the intricacies of right versus wrong. It's just a way of playing that out and learning in a different way. That's my thought. Yeah, and and I think that literature and storytelling is the perfect place to experience the experience evil in a way that you can understand it in order to avoid it and fight against it, but you don't have to live it out in your life and hurt yourself and people, you know? And, and I think that any good story needs to have set up um, an antagonist to make the, to make the fight that is being fought mean anything like a book about racism that everyone sits around and says, Glad no one's racist is not a very impactful book, you know, like you, you need to experience the, that conflict there. And I think people can do that in healthy and unhealthy ways. Like, I think that it's very easy for people, especially when they first start playing D and D to have kind of the, what I like to call the Skyrim mentality, which is I am the hero of this story And if anyone doesn't treat me with the utmost respect and kindness in every word they say, well, they die. Um, Because that's how most people play Skyrim. Like, sorry, what'd you say to me? (laughs) Shing. Um, And so a lot of players start playing D&D with the Skyrim mentality and are what I, D&D players often call murder hobos, where they just kind of wander around killing whatever they want because... They think there are no consequences to their actions. And once you get more into the game, you realize that actually the game's more fun when you play through the story and invest yourself in what is happening and start to actually contribute other than instead of derail. And I think that's a great parallel for life that if you just run around being selfish all the time, it actually gets boring pretty quick and stops being that good for you or anyone else. But if you invest and try to contribute, it actually gets much more intricate and fun and, and nuanced. And there's so much more to explore that way. Well, what are your thoughts, Veronica? Has, do you have any, any ideas about that? Or or have you ever been condemned for playing D and D or anything like that? Oh, condemned for D and D is the least of my (laughs) condemnation. Um, (laughs) Uh, yeah, no, I was going to say that, I mean, one of my experiences or several of my experiences playing D&D as a player and also as 
DM or or GM um, has been uh, sort of watching a team or a party go from murder hobos just sort of out for themselves to uh, try to think of the best way barred himbos I guess would be the best way the antithesis where of it's sudden yeah where it suddenly just becomes a dating simulator um <laughs> and, yeah having your best friend flirt with his other best friend who is the dm through a character is a very odd experience it's a it, it's yeah odd, it's like not hot experience there, <laughs> make that distinction. it's uh yeah it's definitely um yeah, I've 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 had some games. Um and but yeah, I, I definitely agree with just the fact that it is a fun way to sort of explore these different worldviews um or these different actions you can take. And even just like I even remember playing my first game and being like, yeah, I'm going to be I'm going to be like chaotic evil because that's going to be so fun and no one can tell me what to do. And then being in a party with a bunch of people who were also doing that, it was like, uh, uh, yeah. it was too much. And so you it's eventually, literally hell. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and so I, I know that I, and I'm still guilty of doing this. I'll be like, no, we need to have somebody who's not a psychopath. Like, um, we need to have somebody on this team who isn't just going to murder a barn full of children. Like, uh, and um, I'll still do that. I admit to the fact that I still. Well, I was that character once. I was <laughs> not too long ago. I was the one, I was a cleric who was uh, chaotic good, thankfully not lawful good. But I was in a party <laughs> of a lot of characters that were not that alignment. And man, it was, I was yeah. very frustrated by the whole experience because I'm trying to like yeah. maintain everyone being a party together and like cooperating. And then they were all like yeah. lying behind my back and running away from me. Very frustrating. Yeah. It's, it's exhausting. It and um, I also tend to be the note taker in the group. Mm. So then it results in me always having to fill everyone else mm. in and like once we finally get back on track with the story. So, um, yeah. I recently got involved in a new campaign with a new uh, DM, and this is the first time I'll be playing as a player in several oh, years, wow. um, which is really exciting That's for cool. me. Yeah. And uh, she is encouraging all of us to actually have fun since it's a group of DMs as well. Um, so I decided I was going to play an amnesiac character, which is also an excuse to not take notes. <laughs> I, so, <love> <laughs> I, love I just, it. it's, I, I, I think that tabletop role-playing games are a really excellent way of, of gaining some sort of, I don't want to say world knowledge, but maybe like moral knowledge. Yeah. yeah I think it's um, a really fascinating way to explore different philosophies mm -hmm. in a really interesting way. Um, that was kind of repetitive, but whatever. Um, and yeah, I think, so I taught D and D um, at an elementary school as their little like extracurricular for seventh and eighth grade. I did that for, I did that three years. Um, and that was so fun because you get a group and at the beginning they're all like, Murder just hobos. terrible. Yeah. Terrible at playing the game. And a lot of people are like, Oh, you can't be bad at D and D. No, you can. <laughs> if you're, <laughs> if you're, if you're a selfish and horrible player, that's only invested in what happens to your character. You're bad at playing D and D because you make it less fun for everyone else. And I told yeah. that to my group, I was like, in some ways you can't be bad at it. Cause it's just about, you know, doing what your character would want to do, but you can. Um, but it's so rewarding to see like characters that are like, I'm playing a, a rogue assassin that's been alone since he was a child that doesn't trust anyone. And like, be like, that's going to be fun. And then like two sessions in, they're like, 
I wish I could like be involved in what the party's talking about or like, I wish anyone in the party trusted me to do anything. But everyone yeah, always like, ends up playing themselves. So, I mean, eventually that character Everyone always gonna, plays themselves. Even, even in the campaign when we were the bad guys, we ended up adopting this orphaned orc who was in a, like, Coliseum gladiator <laughs> battle. And we were like, no, we have to save him. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. committing horrible, horrible deeds. Um, I, I did want to push back, though, and say that I think the benefits of D&D only go so far as you have a good group of people you're playing with. And by good, I mean like morally good people, like people you trust to help you be a better person. Because I'm assuming yeah. there exist fantasy role-playing games out there where the purpose is to abuse other people or be racist, be misogynist, mm -hmm. uh, seek out yeah. barnfuls of, of kids to burn down. Yeah. Like, you can create a really hellish community that's going to have negative spiritual effects on you because you're deliberately seeking it out and choosing to be a part of it and, and reveling in the evil of it. Um, so again, I've never partook in a group like that, thankfully, like, but I have to assume that they exist. Do you think, do you think that the game would like amplify those issues or that's just more an issue with well, having I'm a community saying, like that at all? I'm saying having a GM or DM specifically being like creating a world where you guys can just like live out your neck beard, misogynistic, evil, <laughs> like, yeah. like we've been wronged by these people in life. So let's create this fantasy world where we can um make women do whatever we want like i don't know yeah. like there has to be that existing and i think that's just awful it it does exist because i've been a part of those really groups. what's that like um, it must just be it's yeah. awful um i've dm'd for a group like that uh once um and i've been a player in a group were they like with that. people you knew and they were with people i knew and it was awful uh yeah. i don't super talk to those people I was about to anymore say, did it, how did it um, affect your relationships with them yeah because it really does become like you can only go so far into a character you know sure. so it's just like yeah i'm gonna be i'm gonna hate elves for whatever reason um and then it's just like that can be a character thing but if it keeps coming up and if it keeps, or, or even just like you mentioned, it happens a lot, especially, uh, especially against women. Um, and being the only woman in a play group, um, it almost feels like being a secret agent sometimes. Uh, so when you're playing with a bunch of men and they're just like, no, we need to, to save the woman because maybe she'll like give us favors. And it's just like, no, no, that's not how that works. Or, or even just being like, um, there was one game where one of the characters was trying to rape someone. And it's just, I don't know why the DM let it go that far. And I had to leave. I couldn't sit there anymore. And like every like the other guys were like laughing about it. And it's just like this isn't this isn't fun. No this good. isn't funny. Mm -hmm. And it and this is when I was starting out playing. So it was like my first interaction or one of my first interactions with this Back. team was that That's sort of stereotypical yeah the stereotypical nerdy geek boy gatekeeper neckbeard you know um like a men's rights activist you know like it was awful and the fact that i was able to actually come back to dnd and other other rpgs like that is awesome like i'm so grateful for it because i have fantastic friends and it's a fun right. time but those groups do exist they uh they are more prevalent than they should uh, be than, I, than it should yeah. be yeah because because they see it as this moment where they can live out these 
gross fantasies. Thoughts. Yeah, these. Fa- I don't even like calling them fantasies. Like, <laughs> no, I know what you mean. And it's funny to bring that like, back to the initial question because I don't think the boomers that are like, oh, people playing D and D and worshiping gods that aren't Jesus. Yeah. Like, I don't think they're thinking of this as the evil sort of outlet. Like, I don't think this is in their right. mind as what's wrong with D&D, but the fact that people are pretending to worship other gods and that sort of thing. Yeah. It's, just, it's just interesting. Like, that's not the evil that I see present in, present in D&D. Yeah. These made-up religions, but it's the morals involved in it. Yeah. Yeah, and, I and I think, like, from a religious standpoint, D&D is kind of a cool world in that, like, you you don't really have atheists in D and D like, because the gods are so actively present. People are like, yeah, like there's a paladin right there. How do you think they're able to smite people? Yeah. Like the, and it's, so it's an interesting way to, to experience kind of a, for, for me as a religious person, an interesting way to experience a way of like, uh, 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 on almost a metaphor for the way that I think God interacts with me. You know, obviously he doesn't give me supernatural powers, but also <laughs> like, haha. <laughs> That's but, second level but also, ordination like, right there. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for that blue stole baby. Uh, but also like in a lot of ways, in my opinion, like my ability to think the way that my mind thinks and have the freedom to do what I want. I only don't think those are supernatural because everyone always has them, you know, and those are really cool powers that I don't, that I I don't necessarily have to have had. Um, And so it's cool to experience, even if it is, you know, worshiping other gods, like, Oh, my, my paladin serves Paylor. You're like, um, that's not Jesus Christ. And it's like, yeah, but it's also not me doing it. Like, I don't actually me worship Paylor. Like, it's not what is happening. Um, yeah. But yeah, when my when my mom was in high school, she played D&D and she had to go to the principal and explain the game. Really? To make sure that it wasn't, so that, yeah, to make sure that it wasn't devil worship. Oh, no. It was like right right in the when she was in high school it was like right during the height of the yeah D&D yeah. Devil the scare yeah, I, said that yeah. Like D&D. I mean i think it's just the basics of hating what you don't understand and fearing the unknown mm-hmm. and control issues yeah it's actually a super fun rabbit hole to dive down i wouldn't want to like <laughs> it is. derail to talk about <laughs> satanic panic 80s but i saw a whole presentation about it from lucian greaves who's the like spokesperson for the satanic temple which is a poorly I think poorly Was branded. Birth name Lucian? I think so. It's, awesome. He's metal as hell. He yeah. looks so cool. He has like he has a fake eye, and he like always wears a vest. And I don't know. He like looks like the guy who would be in charge of the Satanic Temple. But Satanic Temple is not a religion, but an activist organization that like seeks to counteract poor religion treating people badly. And so I saw a whole uh, presentation by him talking about the Satanic Panic in the eighties and how they like branded D and and the idea of Satanism as like the highest moral uh, adversary to combat and made up all kinds of stuff that hurt people for decades. And now wow. it's just entirely faded away. Yeah. Um, but like to the yeah. point where there, I just recently watched a instructional video for cops about how to identify satanic crimes. Um, and so I watched like 45 minutes of the thing and I was like, cool, I guess I'll just Google it and see if there were ever any satanic crimes. Cause I'm still skeptical and like sure enough, zero crimes ever <laughs> like were yeah. definitively How old was attached. that video? It happened. Oh, it was like late eighties. It's like weirdly recent. send it to our, our police friend <laughs> and see what he thinks about That's it. It's a real, yeah, it's a real <laughs> weird walk. Um, oh man. I love it. Yeah, imagine imagine being like Gary Gygax, like the yeah. create the creator of D and D, and be like, guys, I <laughs> like I made this. I know what it you is. Like the it's point. not. <laughs> like I, I don't know. He's just um, like I just wanted to have fun. I don't know yeah. where this is all coming from. I just thought fantasy was cool. Yeah, the role play. Um, this is also reminding me yeah, of the uh, Halloween video that me and Luke did. Yeah, I, I think these are the same people who would hate Halloween and who like 
maybe don't yeah. want their kids to buy choose your own adventure books. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, what kind of person is not a person I want to be friends with? Right. I hope my heaven doesn't include uh-huh. them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, it's frustrating that people are opposed to it because I think it is like, can be such a productive thing. Mm-hmm. And like we were talking about, like the ability to, to experience and play out nuanced things. And like, I think a good DM puts forward a world where, where what you're doing is nuanced and mm-hmm. there are choices to be made that are hard. Like one of the campaigns that I ran that I think my, my group found the most memorable was they were serving the God of death and but like the his kind of philosophy was the the necessity of balance in all things and if life goes on forever then life is meaningless and so it has to end and so like part of their job was trying to destroy the immortality of the elves which would just like massacre just thousands and thousands of old elves that would lose their immortality and die but it was a nuanced issue that they were like, oh, but like, is the meaning of life given through the fact that it ends or is it elsewhere? Mm-hmm. Like, why really does life have meaning? And like, that's that, that's an interesting thing to be able to be a part of a story talking about that. Yeah. And that's not really something you can just kind of do to the, with the same power. Just like, let's have a conversation about how, why life has meaning that living out a story about that is a different thing entirely. Yeah, the elves were jerks, so. Thank yeah, well, that helps. I have I have thoughts and feelings about elves that we don't have to get into. <laughs> <laughs> well, we probably should wrap up anyway. Um, it's about that time. Uh, fine. But, man, I have to yeah. play no D&D worries. now. I'm just itching for well, Hey, we might be playing I know, on Monday. Monday's going up. That'll be great. Week. I finally found a campaign with Veronica, which is really fun. Oh, nice. We're going to do like a two, two Oh, you guys are in the thing. same yeah. one? I'm yeah. really pumped. I'm, I'm going to play a druid who just isn't that into plants and really, but really gets fungus. And so he's going to be just a heavily a fun fungus-based magic user. My, I'm pumped about it. My uh, ranger that I'm playing right now, uh, who I made as sort of a caricature of a character, but his favorite enemy is He's plants. wonderful. For then you just never <laughs> fight plants. So he just like hates plants. <laughs> I, the That's the DM was very favorite. nice to build one plant based combat. But honestly, having a favorite enemy isn't even that great. It's just a fun flavor thing. But he's also a lot of fun flavor. Wears a tuxedo, thing. so that's basically all I need. His, his name is Colonel, <gasps> Stompy. Colonel Stompy. Just, no. <laughs> oh, I'm so into this. I love him. I love him to death. Look, you want to do your voice well, for him my, real quick? My Colonel Stompy voice is a little a little <gasps> southern. <laughs> I love this so much. Oh, Christ, He's so. a wonderful character. He wears oh a velvet green tuxedo. He's basically if Babar was a sweet southern. Babar gentleman. was my uh, <laughs> illustrative inspiration. Oh my goodness! <laughs> See, I always, uh, I always followed to playing tiefling robes, oh, okay. and they speak with Russian okay, accents like fun. this. Always, <laughs> one of them played the spoon. Played the spoon. Very good. That's, that's dope. Yes, very good. I actually spoons. think accents are a great way to tap into a character like that. That way, it's very clear when you are your character and not. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I always try yeah. to do a little inflection or something. You gotta have yeah. a voice. Character voice is so important. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, Veronica, thank you so much for coming on. I love chatting about D&D. That was fun to talk yeah. about the the morality yeah. of it too. I hadn't really thought yeah. about it in like a cogent sort of way. So that was cool. Yeah, I'm always have, here for this. I have uh, big props to D&D, especially for young adults, because it promotes cooperation in a way that young adults don't get to experience a lot in their lives, where sports will often be sort of cooperative, but also competitive against the other people. It's like pure cooperation activity, um, like actually thinking critically about choices and moral questions. It's mm, like seventh grade through high school D is an amazing teaching tool and now i sound like a youth pastor so hard <laughs> it's also good for math yeah huh? yeah Uncle my maths. my basic arithmetic yeah my quick maths have quite uh significantly improved <laughs> <playing D&D. laughs> 
All right. Well, Veronica, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure, Shad. Of course. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. We'll talk to you later. Yeah. Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye. All right. That's the end. Thank you so much. Bada Should bing, we just, bada boom. Into the outro here and see how we do. That's what I was doing with my bada bing, bada boom, Luke. You don't want to say bada bing, bada boom no, at the end the of our classic outro? lead in, yeah. <laughs> how did you yeah, not that's, get that? How else do you do an outro, <laughs> Luke? <laughs> Thanks so much for watching our show. We did something a little different this week, but I really like how it turned out. If you want to be on the show, you can send us an email at spiritablepodcast at gmail.com. Um, if you're just listening to the audio, you can watch us on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, you can comment below. Um, if you like the show, feel free to support us by uh, liking our videos and subscribing. But honestly, just tell your friends, people that might like it. Word of mouth is a great way to give support. Thanks so much.